Well, the main reason we shoe horses is because usually the footing and or the ground is fairly abrasive to their hooves and you need to reduce the wear uh, to keep them sound. And then you go into other aspects where you want to change how a horse moves, uh, whether it's a hunter or a jumper. So you have to um, manipulate that with shoe position and trim. The main reason you go with aluminum is you're trying to reduce the weight on the bottom of the foot to in turn reduce the action of the knee and keep the foot closer to the ground hence you're getting more shoulder movement kind of a daisy cutter movement which uh, hunter people and judges like um, and then you go into the therapeutic uses of uh, aluminum which you're reducing weight you can you can do a lot more things uh, for lameness with aluminum shoes um, and not have five pounds of steel hanging off the bottom of the foot. So steel shoes, um, other than aluminum, you know, the wear is a lot better. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, reverberation as much. Aluminum is is like a tuning fork, so any, any concussion on uh, aluminum uh, emanates right up the leg. So, and then steel, uh, with a jumper, you know, you want some weight on the foot and you, you want that knee and, and getting their feet out of the way. So, you know, in our genre, you know, steel is, is more for mechanics. Cool. So hot shoeing, I mean, for me, the main reason to hot shoe is the shoes that we put on these horses are very wide and very thick. So they're almost impossible to manipulate cold, to shape cold. Um, and then also, since we're dealing with these horses that stand in their stall more than they're outside, they're in a, a, a fungus and bacteria rich environment. So you want to burn that shoe on and seal the bottom of the foot. Um, when you do burn a foot on or burn a shoe on, I look at the burn marks on the bottom of the shoe to tell where I need to adjust that shoe shape to to fit. I don't really, I don't think that there's any downfall to hot shoeing, um, other than it, it takes a lot longer. Sorry. Uh, cold shoeing is kind of a cowboy thing. Uh, you're usually shoeing smaller feet, smaller shoes. It's a lot faster. Uh, they don't have clip shoes most of the time. They're flat shoes, so there's no reason to burn the clips on. Um, that's mainly a Western genre shoeing process, just because of the size of the shoes, and they're really simple to put on. These uh, require that the hot shoe for so many different reasons. I don't even think I know one guy that shoes warm blood horses that shoes cold. Um, specializes in warm blood horses and is successful at it. Lost shoes. Well, lost shoes are kind of a, uh, they're going to happen in this world. And, and here's why. When you have like a cowboy horse that's trotting out through the rocks every day chasing cows, you shoe that horse so it does not lose shoes. Like you don't have the shoes sticking out anywhere. You're not necessarily worried about a horse staying sound because it's not necessarily falling out of the sky or, or doing any sort of athletic movements that it's not otherwise born to do. So jumping horses, you have to support the leg and the bony column and the soft tissue in that, in that leg um, because they are jumping and they're not, that's not a natural thing for a horse to do. So you're combating a lot of injuries by adding support by putting a big shoe on these horses. So, 
jumping horses are going to lose shoes because the shoes are sticking out everywhere. They're made for that horse to go show and jump. They're not put on that horse to be turned out. And that is usually where the jumping horses lose shoes, when they're turned out and they're happy to be out of their stall and not being jumped in the ring. So whenever somebody gets mad at their farrier for losing shoes, especially if they're a jumping horse farrier, uh, everybody needs to think about the fact that that farrier is shoeing for soundness and mechanics on that horse, not shoeing to keep shoes on the other 23 days or 23 hours of the day that that horse lives outside the ring. So it's going to happen. Everybody's going to have to deal with it. And what should we do when a horse does lose a shoe? What's that? What should we do when the horse does lose a shoe? Well, the best thing to do is find the shoe at all costs. Because if you don't have the farrier come out that put the shoe on, you're probably not going to get the same shape and same type, same type of shoe put back on if you actually lose, lose the shoe. Call your farrier if you don't already have another farrier on call. Um, and wrap the foot up and keep the horse inside, in the stall, on shavings. Because when you break foot off, you can't put it back on. It's kind of like a bad haircut. you got to wait for it to grow back out. And a lot of times you break foot off that the nails need to go into and you've got a mess. Pads are sometimes a necessary evil. Um, I don't really like to put pads on because you're adding length to the foot. Because if you think about it, you're adding at least a quarter inch in between the foot and the shoe. Um, and when you're dealing with extra length, that means you're dealing with extra leverage and you have to compensate by shoe position and trim to keep the balance correct. Um, some horses like pads uh, to combat reverberation. Some horses like pads because they have thin soles. Some pads are wedge pads and you're trying to, to get a different mechanical uh, movement to result out of a, a leg or a shoulder. Um, and then sometimes you use pads when you have an abscess and you need to keep stuff covered up and sterile. But um, I'd have to say that, that pads, I try to stay away from pads as much as we can because they, they cause other problems. So unless there's a problem that absolutely needs a pad, uh, we'd, rather, we'd rather remedy that with uh, uh, mechanics of a shoe. So thrush is a problem, especially in wet climates like we have up here in the Northwest. And again, it's like, it's, it's, the, it's the baby of moisture. Um, thrush sometimes cannot be helped. There are some horses that have certain chemicals in their urine that creates uh, a terrible bacteria and fungus climate on the bottom of their feet. So the best thing a person can do with thrush is keep their feet cleaned out, picked out multiple times a day. And, um, and then also know that thrush is anaerobic, so it grows where there's no oxygen. So if you can expose thrush to oxygen, it will go away on its own. Um, and also moisture, you know, if you can seal that foot from the top side and not get uh, moisture down in the nail holes, you're, you're going to be doing yourself a favor too. So yeah, it's, it's a problem that um, you really can't get away from, you just have to deal with. Quarter cracks, they are like, they're Satan. Um, there's a lot of different reasons that a horse will blow a quarter crack. Uh, here on the west coast usually you blow quarter cracks because of hard footing um, they also come from imbalance they can come from uh, metabolistic issues where the lamina in the foot becomes inflamed and unstable um, usually quarter cracks you see them in the in the jumping genre so so hunters and jumpers uh, mainly uh, when when you address a quarter crack not all quarter cracks can be fixed the same way and you don't really know until you start down a path and then make corrections based on improvements or, or not having any improvements. Um, 
usually when I come up to a quarter crack, it's it's kind of like uh, you got to start with one process and move on from there. But when a horseshoer works on a horse for an hour and then walks away for you know four to six weeks, everybody has to do their part in taking care of that quarter crack. So it's it's very very important that everybody does exactly what the horseshoer asks. Otherwise. Uh, you may as well just pull the shoe off and turn the horse out. And not all quarter cracks are the same. Um, having, when, when somebody tells me, oh, well, Fluffy's got a quarter crack, that's kind of like saying, well, Bill's got cancer. Well, okay, what, can, what kind of cancer does Bill have? You know, is he a smoker? Did he, did he uh, use drugs, you know, or did he work in a radiation plant? <laughs> you know, so all, all quarter cracks are different. Um, there's a lot of horseshoers out there that seem to think they're gurus with quarter cracks, but that's just, it's not the case. You, you have to pick a path and go down it and, and make your changes as, as you see improvements. Um, and honestly, quarter cracks, when a horse gets a quarter crack, the best thing you can do is lay that horse up until that cracks halfway down the foot, grown halfway down the foot. And that's, that's going to be uh, the biggest chance for, um, success so uh, one of the biggest uh, complaints horseshoers have especially in an environment like the Northwest is you know you have hot dry summers and then just terribly wet winters and then fall and spring you have both and uh, the, the one thing that we suffer from up here is is poor hoof condition because of those drastic uh, climate changes during the year uh, the one thing that, that owners, trainers, riders can all do to help everybody out is use hoof conditioner like it's free. And when I say that, I mean the hoof conditioner can go on the top of the foot and on the bottom of the foot as liberally as you want. There's very few cases where I've told somebody you're using too much hoof conditioner. And the best way to do to use hoof conditioner is when you when you pull the horse out to go ride or turn out put hoof conditioner on when you put the horse away when you're done with the horse put hoof conditioner on if you have had the horse out several times and it's going to get a bath put hoof conditioner on before the bath because moisture is what we're trying to combat not so much dryness dryness is a problem after the foot's been too moist so we're trying to seal that foot and seal in the internal moisture. All right, so the farrier tools, uh, the main farrier, farrier tools that we use, um, starting with a rasp. A rasp is, is used basically to flatten the hoof and make it really smooth and, and hopefully balanced after you trim the foot. You trim the foot with what we call hoof nippers. Um, these are... I, I think of them as like a surgical tool. You can't use uh, a set of cheap hoof, nipper, hoof, hoof nippers on warm blood feet because the feet are so squishy that if you use nippers that aren't sharp, they actually will pinch and tear the hoof wall. So these nippers, uh, of course, we're up in Seattle and everything I have up here is rusted. Like rust is like the cancer of the Pacific Northwest. But Everything's kept inside. I keep everything pretty oiled up, and these things are dirty, dirty sharp. They will cut a nail. Um, so this is this is the most important tool in the toolbox. Um, driving hammer. It's what you drive the horseshoe nails through the shoe into the hoof with. Um, it's a lighter hammer. It's not like a, a framing hammer. This is a 12 ounce head. So this is another thing that. Um, Whenever I'm traveling and not shooting out of my own truck, I always bring my own driving hammer because it's it's like an extension of your hand and you can't just pick up any driving hammer and have feel and be confident that you're not gonna drive a bad nail. Um, this is a clinch block. When you've driven the nails through the shoe into the foot, you wring the nail tip off, which the nail tip, uh, I don't even see one, we keep it pretty clean around here is in the garbage and you need to block the end of the nail and start the bend which turns into the clinch which holds the nail 
and the shoe on the foot. Anyways, you hit the, the nail head and it seats the nail head in the crease of the shoe and then bends that little nipple of the nail over and starts that the finish process. This is a crease nail puller, so when you're taking shoes off, sometimes you'll just pull nails out instead of just tearing the shoe off. Um, this just pulls the nail out of the crease of the shoe. And as you can see, it fits, it's made to fit a certain nail. Uh, and then up here, we're dealing with a lot of mud, so we use a wire brush. This is a clinch cutter, so when we're pulling shoes off and we're in pretty gnarly, gross feet, uh, we'll actually cut the clinches and then pull the nails. Uh, dead blow hammer, we use this to cut the clinches. A lot of guys will use driving hammers, which is totally fine. But on jumping horses, their feet are sometimes sore. I mean, they're falling out of the sky every day. So they they tend to like the dead feel of this dead blow hammer instead of the ringing of the driving hammer. There's a lot of difference between that on the bottom of a foot and this. And those horses can feel that. And then we get into the anvil and, and the tongs. The tongs hold the shoes when their shoes are really hot. You know, obviously you can't, can't hold them with your bare hands, so you have to hold them with a tong. So this is a hoof stand. We use it when we're dressing the feet down and or finishing the feet, clinching the nails. Uh, it's a plastic stand with a, a rubber ball on it. So it's pretty comfortable on their foot, especially if you have a horse with an abscess or whatnot, you don't really want to stick it on a hard stand. And these horses usually will just stand here all day long uh, with their foot up on the stand, you know. They're pretty comfortable. They like to stretch. And then you've got everything in that trailer, which we use to doctor the shoes up with, you know, grind the shoes so that hopefully they don't step them off or cut themselves. Drill and tap for stud holes. Um, drills uh, to put pads on shoes. It's kind of like a mobile machine shop. So that's about it as far as tools go. I mean, we could go further into other tools, but I think everybody would be pretty bored about that. Testers, one of the most misused tools in the shoeing business. So if you come around here, what these are used for is to find sensitivity in the bottom of a foot. Now I can take a sound horse and use these hoof testers on a sound horse and get this horse to jump. There's no problem with that. And the horse won't have anything wrong with it. What you want to do is you want to find sensitivity in a foot that you cannot desensitize. So like I could pick this horse's foot up who's not sore and hoof test the frog and she's going to jump the first time. I can continue to hoof test the frog and she will become desensitized by it and she will quit reacting to the pressure. So when you're hoof testing a horse, you want to go over the spot several times until she either continues to react or quits reacting to it. If she continues to react to it, you know you have a problem. So when you're hoof testing, say for a coffin joint, this is palpating the navicular bursa, so the bottom side of the coffin joint. You can see that she's not reacting to it at all on either side. So you know that that coffin joint is cold, it's not inflamed. Now you can also, hoof test the width of the foot by squeezing the, so the heels together. This is also hoof testing for caudal heel pain and navicular bursa pain, uh, basically the attachments of the soft tissues on the back part of the foot. Then you can hoof test the sole all the way around and then you can also hoof test the heels. As you can see, I mean this mare is not sore at all. But you can make any horse jump. These things are very, very strong. So you have to be careful. You 
these things are really stiff because of Seattle. You have to be careful using these things because this horse is sound, but I can make this horse move. See, she's starting to pull on me. This is why I use very short handled hoof testers. The big long handled hoof testers, they're too much leverage, period. You can make any horse move with those. So you need to use the hoof testers with the very small face so that you can pinpoint the location of which you want to hoof test. And you need to have hoof testers with short reins or short handles so that you don't add over amounts of pressure to the location. Most misused tool ever. Oh, that's cool. What's cool? You're that. Oh, yeah, so I don't get COVID in my mouth. Because <laughs> I put my nail Oh, in. really? Yeah. Is it actually why you got it? That's exactly why I got it, yeah. Yeah, I used to just take, you know, a handful of nails and stick them in my mouth. And uh, just, you know, feed myself nails, yeah. you know, as I go. but. It's been really super hard adjusting to not doing that. 